Get the home field advantage every time with Fairfield by Marriott, official hotel partner of the NCAA. Whether you're a student athlete working toward your championship dreams or your team's biggest fan, Fairfield by Marriott has everything you need to get ready for game day. From comfortable guest rooms to complimentary hot breakfast, Fairfield is part of the Marriott Bonvoy portfolio of hotels and official hotel partner of the NCAA. Visit fairfield.marriott.com to book your next game day stay. Welcome into The Verge, a show which covers the Baltimore Orioles minor leagues. The Verge is part of BSL Radio. Baltimore Sports and Life is dedicated to analysis and discussion on the Orioles, Baltimore Ravens, and the University of Maryland. The site has a team of writers providing coverage of those teams and houses live streaming content weekly. Join the conversations at the message board, like BSL on Facebook, and follow BSL on Twitter. On Twitter. Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere and even earn money all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer, so no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since we discovered Spotify for Podcasters, we feel like having options like video podcasts and Q&A lets us be more creative on another level. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. Welcome to On The Verge. This is Zach Spedden, joined as always by Bob Phelan and Nick Stevens. Uh, On The Verge is part of Baltimore Sports and Life Radio. And on tonight's episode, we're going to discuss the Orioles International Free Agency class. Uh, In addition, we're going to get into the news about the fences being moved back at Canham Yards and some of the implications that we think that will have not just on the Major League team, but possibly on some prospects in the Orioles farm system. And we're also going to have some good news on the injury front for D.L. Hall. Uh, That'll be on tonight's show. But we're going to start off with our interview with Orioles International Director of Scouting, Kobe Perez. Kobe gave us... uh, some time earlier today to talk about the players that the Orioles just acquired as part of the international free agency signing period. We pre-recorded that interview before doing our normal live show on Monday evening. So we'll bring you that now and uh, then get into the rest of our show. Tonight's guest for On the Verge is the Orioles Senior Director of International Scouting. He is Kobe Perez. Kobe, thank you so much for joining us. Nah, it's a pleasure to be on. Thank you guys for having me. I'm still I just got back from overseas, so I got to help my wife take down the Christmas trees. <laughs> well, we appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule. Um, just to start off, um, how have the how has the organization's international signing efforts evolved since you uh, first joined the Orioles? Yeah, as you guys know, I mean, it takes time to uh, to build to build the, the uh, international pipeline. Um, just because uh, deals are created uh, so far early uh, before the signing period begins, so you know, just you know, last year I thought we we did the best we could with uh, the time that we had, being that we've been here three years. Um, but I felt like this year we um, we got a really good jump, and as you can see, you know, a couple of our players were ranked in the top you know, top of the class. So, uh, you know, we feel good about the uh, talent that we're bringing in. Yeah, absolutely. And is there an organizational philosophy on signing, you know, a bunch of players for a little bit of lower bonus versus a few, just a few expensive or more, you know, more expensive guys? Or is that just where the organization stands as of right now, as we continue to build up the operations? Yeah, so every year is going to differ. Um, the, those guys that get the you know the three four million dollar bonuses, they're they're off the board. You know, two three years ahead of time. So um, I think every year will be different. I think uh, it depends what the what the what the class looks like, what the market looks like. You know, those those big huge Wander Francos of the world. You know, they they you know there's a there's a handful of them every four or five years. So. You know, we don't want to just give a guy the money just to give it to him. We want to make sure it's the right guy. So, you know, uh, in these three years, we've we've been able to uh, spread it around and feel good about our classes. You got to remember, you know, a lot of the best players in the big leagues didn't get the millions of dollars. You know, Acuna, Albies, 
you know, these guys signed for, you know, a hundred grand, 300, 400, you know what I mean? And uh, a lot of them uh, have panned out to be good players. So, uh, you know, we're hoping that that's what we get. Nice. Uh, we want to ask you a, a touch on some of those specific players you guys brought in over the weekend. Um, starting at the top with Braylon Tavera, uh, what are you and your scouts uh, seeing Tavera? And, you know, we think it's really encouraging to see that, you know, reports suggest that he could stick in center field. Uh, but what kind of projection do you guys see with, with the bat? What type of hitter he can become? Yeah, we, we're really intrigued by, by his tools. Um, we think he has a skill set for, for five tools. Um, obviously, he's 16. A lot of things uh, still got to go. Um, but we think with our development system, um, we think we can get the best out of him. I mean, he's got an he's got ability to hit the ball over the fence. Um, he's got ability to stay in center field. He runs really, really well. He's a big kid. He's, he's you know, every bit of six foot three. Um, and, and it's a six, five, 60 yard dash. So, you know, you, it, it's a uh, speed power combination that's very rare. And especially in a young kid like that, so, you know, we're excited to get him and we think, uh, you know, we can develop him into a, uh, into a good baseball player. So the news about Cesar Prieto uh, caught a lot of Orioles fans by surprise ahead of the signing deadline. It was a very pleasant surprise. Can you tell us how that came together, that the Orioles were able to sign him? And then what is the immediate plan for him as a 22-year-old with a fairly advanced skill set? Yeah, as I mentioned, um, you know, we've known Prieto through international tournaments, but obviously the Cuban players are hands-off until they're declared uh, free agents by Major League Baseball. So you know, we had him on our radar, but we never knew when, you know, you don't know when this guy is going to defect, if he's going to defect, you just don't know. And, uh, you know, once we heard that he, he had defected, you know, we tried to figure out where he was, who had, you know, who was his agent and all those things. You know, once we finally figured out who it was, we know we got in, t- in contact with him. Um, we had some money remaining in our pool. So, you know, we, we, we felt like, you know, we had to evaluate this guy good. And we did, um, you know, we had, um, you know, front office members, myself, Eve Rosenbaum, our general manager, Mike Elias, and even our major league manager, Brandon Hyde, evaluate um, Caesar. And we all went out and saw him, um, you know, talked them, you know, talk, talked up the Orioles for him. Um, and, you know, there was other suitors for him, but, you know, he kind of liked our situation and, uh, you know, being that there wasn't very much money out in the in the market, um, other teams were in the similar ballpark. Um, he decided that his best opportunity was with the Orioles. So we were really excited, you know, that he chose us and, and we were happy to get him uh, at where we got him. And uh, I think, uh, you know, time will tell, but, you know, his track record is pretty good. So, you know, we hope that everything goes well. Yeah, and we know a little bit about Leandro Arias because he was on the top 50 list of Baseball America of the prospects. But what about Edwin Amparo, who signed for 650000 which tied for Prieto for the fourth highest bonus given out for the Orioles? Um, can you give us a little bit of a scouting report on Amparo and what made him such a big target? Yeah, so Amparo is a you know, good-looking kid. He's a switch-hitting shortstop who can run, uh, you know, really good bats of ball skills. We think he has the ability to play shortstop. Um, he, we think he's, he's got room to grow. He's, he's every bit of six foot. Um, he's lean, he's lanky. Um, and he does a lot of the, the good things. He's a smart baseball player for his age and he separated himself kind of from, uh, the group. Um, I think, you know, with him, he was pretty high profile and a lot of teams wanted him. Um, I think his, uh, you know, the reason we were able to get him was kind of the same reason, you know, we, we had, you know, Mike go down and see all these players and, and uh, you know, they're excited. They're excited that, you know, our general manager is in the DR and saying, hey, we want you. You know what I mean? It's a, you know, some, some general managers from some teams don't know about these guys till they're in double A, you know, and our general managers, you know, watching them when they're 14, 15 years old and telling them, hey, we, we got we're, we got your eye, we are, you're our eye on you. And, you know, we got this academy building and you know everyone knows that we're in for the long haul in latin america you know this academy is it's a long-term play you know it's not just oh well we're here for a year and we're out of here no we're made, we're building now and and people know that we're going to take the best care of their player as as we can and try to make them you know get to the major league as soon as they can so um i think that that's helped us go a long way with uh with signing some of our players 
I, I love that so much. Um, one more specific player I want to ask uh, about is Thomas Sosa. Uh, to me, just kind of reading what uh, you said, some a little bit about him and what was on video, and what little bit we know about him, I, I get immediate like Michelle Desson vibes out of him. Uh, and we know that's a player that you really like as well. Someone with a lot of raw tools, real potential to develop into an impact player down the road. What are some of his bigger strengths that make him uh, an attractive player? Yeah, Thomas is, a, you know, he's six foot four, lean, lanky, left, left play uh, outfielder who's come a really long way. I mean, when we first saw him, he was 13 years old. He kind of wasn't on the showcase market, but we really liked his swing and we really liked the way he hit the ball. And we can see that, you know, he had a long way to go as far as growing and getting bigger. So he was one of the guys that we really, really focused in on early before many other teams got a chance to see him. And he kind of bloomed and bloomed and we were like on him every day. So, you know, it was to the point where he was like, man, I, I just want to be an Oriole because we were in there so much and we were able to come to terms with him. And after that, he just he just continued to grow. He became to be a six foot four kid hitting balls well over the fence, you know, running, you know, six, seven. And, um, you know, we, we're excited to get him. And every single day, he's one of the kids throughout the two years every day you can see the difference of him getting better. So, you know, we think he's on the up and up and we're really excited about him. Love it. You mentioned over the weekend that you frequently visit Venezuela and noted how the Orioles didn't really have a presence in that country until recently, but now you guys bring in 10 players in this year's class to go along with the, one of the big signings last year, Michael Hernandez. Uh, what is it about the talent in this region that really makes it has made it a priority for the organization? Well, Venezuelan, there's a lot of talent there. And one good thing about Venezuelan players, they really know how to play baseball. Like if you go to watch a game, sometimes the Venezuelan players tools wise is a little bit below the DR player when they're young. Um, for some reason, the Dominican player, there's so much baseball and so many academies that uh, tools wise, they develop sooner. Uh, but the, the Venezuelan player, um, they really know how to play baseball. Like you, you watch the game and they may not stand out tools wise, some of them. But when you watch the game, you're like, wow, this guy's a pretty good baseball player, man. I'd like to have this guy. And that's what you get a lot. And then once it starts getting closer, uh, the signing date, then you really see those tools start to come on. And you're like, man, I'm really glad that this guy's with us because, you know, those tools are coming. And um, they, they play a lot of baseball. Their their education level in Venezuela is pretty good. So they're really smart. And, you know, they, they want to really um, do well. So, you know, we're excited and that now we have a full staff there. I travel there, our, our, our Latin American supervisor, Geraldo Cabrera travels there. So we're there all the time, you know? So like now we're going to try to get the, you know, the best talent that we can out of it. Looking at some of the players who may not have had big signing bonuses um, or didn't get a lot of notice from national outlets leading up to January 15th. Um, who do you think are maybe some of the under the radar signings that the Orioles have made that fans could get acquainted to quickly? Yeah, the same thing. Is that there's a Venezuelan player named Gene Mata, who's an outfielder who we really, really like. He was a, he was a, he was the guy that every event we went to, he was like the MVP of the event. But his tools were a little bit below, you know, some of the other players' tools. So scouts didn't see the run, uh, didn't see the, the the throw, didn't see the power. But uh, you know, when we stayed on him, let's say let's stay on this guy because this guy's you know he's just a good player. Um, you know, now he's a six six sixty yard dash. Now he's hitting the ball over the fence sometimes. So we feel that, you know, we got a really good deal with him and we think that he's going to be a player that's going to perform. So, you know, we're excited about adding Gene Mata, among other guys, too. Now that this class has officially signed, what are the next steps for them? Uh, what will the next few months look like uh, leading up to the 2022 Dominican Summer League season? So, yeah, we got we got a uh, orientation on, uh, I believe it starts January 28th. Uh, in the Dominican Republic. So all of our new signs will report to the Dominican Republic Academy, our current academy, obviously. Um, and uh, our, our, you know, um, uh, player development staff from the U.S. and the DR will be there to greet them and kind of show them the Oriel way and, and teach them how to become professional. So we have a pretty good camp coming up uh, here at the end of the month. And, you know, after that, they'll 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 all report for the DSL. When is the uh, exciting new academies uh, expected to be finished? So, yeah, as you know, you know, that's fluid. Um, it's it, the ball's rolling. I was just there. I saw, you know, you, you 
look at it and you can see the shapes of the fields and you can see some holes being dug and all that. So, you know, there's a bunch of people working on it, but as you know, you know, those, those you know, I, I'm looking forward to go back in two or three weeks and see the progress, but uh, um, it should be done within, you know, 15 to 18 months is what I'm being told, but, you know, weather, sometimes the export, exportation, importation um, gets held up. Everything's a little bit slow now because of COVID, but, you know, we're hoping we can get it in that time frame. Yeah, I just had a house built, so I, I definitely can, on a smaller scale, see how that is. Uh, I heard you say, or I read you say in a different article that uh, Samuel Basalo, the former record-breaking uh, signee, will make his stateside debut in the FCL this season. Um, can we expect the same with Michael Hernandez, Anderson De Los Santos, Junior Lara, and guys like that? Yeah, yeah. They're scheduled to go to the Florida League. Um, and as I mentioned, man, these guys are young. You know, Basayo could be a junior right now. You know, he's 17 years old. He'll play all year till August as a 17-year-old. And the guy's got, you know, a year under his belt. He had five home runs. You know, that would have been his sophomore year if he was in high school. And he's got a year under his belt in football. So we're excited about that entire group. Anderson De Los Santos had a very, very good year at the DSL. Junior Lara um, had some issues at the beginning because he had COVID. But uh, so he didn't get that many at bats, but we're excited. It's a left, left center fielder that can run. And, and he, you know, he's a prospect. You know, we're excited about Michael Hernandez, who shows all the tools and and he's down there. He got stronger at the Instructional League Strength Camp. Um, we're, we're super excited about a kid named uh, Ben Cosme, who's another shortstop who we think is a good looking kid. And, um, you know, that's the benefit of having two teams. These guys, they play, you know, both shortstops play, both both shortstops had at bats and you know that's why uh that's why we're doing it because you know they're so young where you can figure out and give people the opportunity to to show what they got yeah and speaking of the age of these literally kids i mean orioles fans we're excited about you know all these guys of development but excluding cesar prieto who's a little bit older and more uh experienced when can orioles fans realistically expect to see that first wave of international prospects like hit the shore proverbially of uh the major leagues I think, you know, this year, if you, if you uh, look at our Delmarva club, I got, I, I got to, I got to say, you know, there's a good chance that there's double digit kids out of Latin America there. Um, we have a lot of pitchers that we like. We like, uh, you know, who, uh, Rangel, Raul Rangel. We like Chase, Luis Ortiz. Uh, Del there's a De Los Santos that we like. There's a, there's a kid named Mendez that throws 99. So, you know, I think in Delmarva, you'll see a lot of those arms that we signed three years ago because we were late, you know, getting in. I think you'll see a lot of those uh, arms in, uh, in Delmarva. And then, you know, we got to, we acquired some guys in trades that, that, you know, have a good chance to be in Delmarva as well. So I think, um, you know, we're starting to get these guys to affiliates. And I think going forward this year, going forward, you'll start seeing our upper level start filling with, uh, with international players. And, uh, you know, we're super excited about that. Love it. Uh, to kind of wrap up, and thank you again for, for your time here with us, but we've hypothesized in the past that the front office is using the Rule 4 draft to kind of raise the floor of this farm system, while the international market is to kind of raise the ceiling. Is that a fair, if, if anything, a simplistic assessment of, of what the organization is doing? I mean, that, that's, that sounds pretty good. I mean, with the, with the international guys, they take it takes time for them to, to get up the line, but what, what typically happens is you know, the, the guys that you draft domestically, especially the college players, you know, they're going to show what they are within two or three years where the Latin kid, you're gonna, you got to wait five or six years. So what happens is it's going to be, it's our organization is ranked right now the best in, in minor league baseball, according to some uh, publications. So when with the backfill of these Latin guys, you know, once these guys get promoted, it's going to keep us strong. You know, it, it'll keep us strong. And then with the new drafts, and the backfill of like an Anderson De Los Santos, you know, a Basayo, a, uh, you know, Ben Cosme and some of these arms we're talking about, those guys will raise our, our farm system and keep it strong. Um, so because they're so far away. So you're going to start seeing the guys we signed three years ago start popping up into our top 30. And then, you know, once you get the pipeline going and it's all the way up and you, our hope is you see one or two 40 man guys a year. Nice. And we can't let you go without asking about uh, one of our favorite players this entire system in Gene Pinto. 
Uh, was he the real headliner in that Jose Iglesias trade? And, and just looking out, how familiar were you with a lot of those international prospects that the Orioles got in some of these trades recently and uh, Pinto, Deson, De Leon, uh, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, all the credit goes to our pro scouting department, Mike Snyder and his group. They identify these guys. Obviously, we're a collaborative group, so they ask us, hey, did you see this guy? Do you know this guy? Do you know this guy's makeup? And, you know, we, we, we were able to uh, – support them in, in knowing their makeups, knowing what the kid, what the kid's all about. You know, some of our scouts are from the same towns. So they, they know all these guys. Uh, and, and we, we, we were happy to, to acquire the guys we got, you know, we, you know, we were definitely involved in the discussions, but the identification was definitely done by our scouting staff. Well, Kobe, thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's been exciting to see the Orioles really competing in the international market, and we know you're a big part of that. And so thank you for taking the time out to join us today. I really appreciate you guys having me on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We'll get into the interview with Kobe Perez and shout out our latest patron to join our Patreon community, and I'll turn that over to Bob. Yeah, we had another new patron. Seems like we're getting one a week. Hey, I'll take that every day. That's pretty cool. Exciting. Our newest member is Logan Pretty, and he's sitting pretty as the, the newest member of the patron. So thank you, Logan, for joining us. We appreciate the support of all of our patrons and all of our listeners. Uh, Kobe Perez joined us earlier today and gave us a lot of great insight, not just about the players that they just signed, that the Orioles signed over the weekend, but about what goes into signing these players, the years of scouting that are involved, and sort of how their philosophy has evolved in the last few years. So there's a lot to unpack from that interview, and I'll let Nick start just kind of with his general thoughts. What was your biggest takeaway from the discussion with Kobe? Uh, it's difficult not to give away uh, so much for the people <laughs> listening live, uh, but – yeah, he seemed like just a genuinely uh, good guy, and I can't thank him enough for giving us time uh, sitting down and talking with us. Almost 20 minutes, which was uh, absolutely amazing. Um, I just got the sense that you know this organization is, is definitely hard at work and putting in the good work behind the scenes, uh, and they are 100% dedicated to making sure that the Orioles are one of these elite franchises in terms of scouting and getting good quality, high-quality international talent. Uh, I mean – the players as well. It, the thing that we've talked about this a lot uh, is like the trade they made last year, the, the Gene Pintos, the Isaac De Leon's, the Michelle De Sons, getting these guys as we we think is throw-ins to deals when clearly uh, they, they are not throw-ins. Or if they are, uh, let's say they are. The Orioles are doing a fantastic job identifying these guys that get overlooked, the guys that don't get the big signing bonuses. And right off the bat, Kobe Perez uh, talked about that. Not all those great international players that you see at the major league level uh, got the super you know, high bonuses. Uh, and the Orioles are done a fantastic job, I think, of identifying these mid-range guys, those sleeper guys. And then once you get them into the system, we know what this player development staff has been capable of so far. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a perfect marriage that's starting to work out. And now we got to see if it works out at the major league level, of course. But uh, fantastic interview. I'm excited for everybody to listen to it. And um, I'm excited to have him back on again next year. Absolutely. Yeah, it was amazing to get to talk to him. And the number one takeaway for me was just how cohesive this front office is. It seems like the entire thing just moves as a unit. They all know what they're doing. They're all on the same page. Everybody's hands on. Mike Elias is down, you know, recruiting like he's a college basketball coach and getting these guys to come sign up for the Orioles and and, and pick the O's over other teams when they can only offer similar amounts of money. So it just seems like everyone's on the same page. And no matter what the Major League uh, product has looked like the last few years, I know once uh, once the ball gets rolling here, it's going to be all good things to come. It was interesting to hear from me about the players that were beyond like the big headline signings. And in particular, Thomas Sosa is a player that really jumps out at me from the way that Kobe Perez discussed him. And the fact that the Orioles – really started to scout him at age 13. I mean, that shows you the amount of years that go into it. I mean, to pick up Sosa now at 16, add him to the system, six foot four, center fielder, hits from the left side, projectable power. We have tweeted out clips of him taking batting practice, and the swing looks really good, but that's only going to tell you so much. So to hear from Kobe Perez about, you know, how they think, how they've already seen him develop physically and how they believe that he's going to project to hit for a lot of power is really encouraging. I, 
I tweeted out when they put the photos, his signing photo up. Like, I don't know what it was. It was just purely my gut. And like, I drink craft IPAs like it's water. So like, it, it's a big gut. I trust it. And all day Saturday, <laughs> like, it just kept telling me Thomas Sosa is your guy, right? And I loved what Kobe Perez had to say about him. That only reinforced that. When I see the video, like my untrained, non-scouting eyes, it sees like that huge frame and so much potential when that fills out. Um, young, raw player. I said in the interview that I just got like this Michelle Deson vibes, that raw, toolsy player, uh, someone that when this player development staff gets their hands on and he matures and, and becomes an adult in five to <laughs> six years, um, <laughs> this is going to be a potentially be a, a big impact, you know, corner outfielder in this system. Um, so yeah, so this is definitely one that I'm hugely intrigued by. Yeah. It's, it's got to take a unique skill to really mm-hmm. scout these kids this young and know how to project them out 10 years down the line, you know, when they're probably going to be hitting the real major league prime, if they get that far, it's, it's a, it's a real skill. And I'm glad we have a guy who's proven to be successful at that with the Cleveland organization. And now he's, so far, so good here as far as the early returns. And it's pretty exciting. Like you said, a lot of these international players are going to show up in Delmarva this year. Probably half the roster is going to be filled with those guys. So we finally get to see them stateside, get some video on MILB TV and, and see what they got. The Dominican Summer League is really where you're going to see the players that were signed this year other than Prieto, who is probably going to you know go somewhere in the mid to high minors. Is kind of what we're expecting. But really, if you follow Delmarva and the FCL next year, you're going to be seeing the early returns on the work that Kobe Perez and Michael Elias have put in international scouting, not just in signing players, but picking players up in trades. You know, so if you thought the team Pinto being in Delmarva last summer was exciting because it was, then I think that next summer is going to be even better there. Yeah. Cause he'll be in Aberdeen. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Right down the road from you, Bob. That's right. I'm psyched. Let's go. Yeah. And just look at like the progression as well. Something that, that I noted uh, because it's, this is what year three uh, of their signing classes. So, you know, that first year they didn't have any time to connect with these kids. Uh, so that class is kind of, you know, I think we can go back and maybe identify a few guys who have progressed and developed into intriguing pieces. But last year we saw the Michael Hernandez and Samuel Basayo uh, and Kobe Perez got me even more excited about Basayo, which is hard to do when you, you watch that kid swing. Uh, but now you're signing arguably the top hitter out of Cuba. Uh, the Orioles doing this. You're seeing them take ten guys out of Venezuela. Uh, you're seeing them dish out uh, continuously dish out higher and higher bonuses to more elite talent. And uh, one of my favorite things that he said was, "You know, the Orioles are giving these kids their pitches." And someone like Braylon Tavera, uh, Edwin Amparo was another one that I think he said was getting a, a lot of love from a lot of other teams that really wanted to sign him. The Orioles are going down there, giving them their pitches. Sending Brandon Hyde, even not just Michael Ice, but Brandon Hyde down there as well in Preto's case, and saying, Here's what we got, here's the opportunity. And these guys are excited to become members of the Baltimore Orioles. Uh, so this it's only I can imagine next year when we have Kobe Perez on, are we talking about a top 10 guy? If there's no draft, of course. But like we're trending in that direction. I think we're trending trending in that direction very quickly, considering, you know, like in Sosa's case, start scout, start scouting him when he's 13 years old. This takes time. And the Orioles just seem to be doing this pretty quickly. So coming out of that interview, was there a player that either of you were maybe not that familiar with? I know I already mentioned Sosa, but was there a player that either of you were not really familiar with that you're now really excited to start following? Uh, the only name I can think of is is Gene Mata. I think he mentioned him as an outfielder that, you know, that isn't getting a lot of publicity, but is right up there with the other outfielders that they signed. And I would say Sosa because that's exciting, a big, tall guy like that with the power potential. It hit the warehouse, you know, somebody's going to one of these years. So, yeah, I say Gene Matta just because that was a, a name that I really didn't know of. Yeah, Matta was definitely interesting um, for sure. The, I think it has – the guys we talked with him about is definitely has to be Sosa. Uh, to hear how quickly he matured as well physically uh, is super exciting. I wish we had more time because there are some other kids on this list that – I've been trying to find as much video as I can, and we've gotten a lot, but there's some that there's just nothing out there yet. But, you know, some of the kids like uh, Jose Naguero, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, but some of the kids that I had noted uh, put stars next to their names, like Jose Naguero, a catcher out of Venezuela they signed. I love that swing. I love how physically mature that kid looks. And you know, Henry Ta- Henry Tejada was a pitcher that I wanted to ask him about. We didn't ask about any pitchers. And we know Orioles fans uh, and, and pitchers uh, probably wanted some of that information, but 
this kid looks like he's nine if you look at pictures of him. But on the mound, he's got some good secondaries already and looks a poised, mature pitcher on the mound. And I'm excited to see what these uh, kind of unheralded names turn into in a couple of years. Yeah, so it was really good to hear from Kobe. And we're excited to follow these players, not only the ones that were just signed by the Orioles, but the ones that are already in the system from previous international free agent classes that are going to be moving up. And um, we'll have a little bit more detailed breakdown next week when we have our top 50 prospect list update, the first one of 2022. We'll tease it a little bit more later in the show, uh, but just wanted to throw that out there now to make sure that you're listening next week. Moving on now to what was a pretty big story late last week into the beginning of this week for Orioles fans. And that's the the news that the left field wall at Candom Yards is moving back. After following the original dimensions since 1992, the Orioles are going to move the left field fence back by as much as 30 feet in some parts while raising it to about 13 feet uh, in height. So the news really comes, you know, the question that has really come up since then is why. And, you know, the what has been cited over and over again is how homer friendly Canem Yards has been towards right handed hitters. And while this is not going to make Canem Yards a pitcher's park or even a neutral park, at least according to most projections, it is going to, you know, bring down that effect a little bit of this being extreme home run hitters park. So we're going to talk about that a little bit, but since we are a minor league podcast, we do want to kind of take a forward look to and figure out who this is going to benefit in the long run, potentially. And I'll just start with Bob. Uh, Looking at this from a higher overview perspective, your thoughts on moving the fence back and what you think it could do for the Orioles in 2022 and beyond at the major league level? You know, I've been pretty on board with what Mike Elias has been doing all these years, and you know, he's making the right moves behind the scenes, but this is just a step too far. Are you going to change the ballpark? Are you kidding me? No, <laughs> I think this is fine. I thought John Mioli had a pretty great uh, column on his newsletter this morning about how it seems like Orioles fans will just <laughs> get angry about anything and completely agree. I think it's about time we got a little bit more neutral, and I'm sure guys like D.L. Hall, who just we mentioned started throwing again today, and Grayson Rodriguez, I'm sure they're, they'll they'll – be grateful for the help and they can use this as a as a convincing argument for if they trade for a top line starter and they want to extend them and keep them around hey we did this you know you don't have to worry about your numbers so much same with free agent signings and if you look at the top 15 or so of our prospects I mean you got Adley Rutschman who is a switch hitter and can hit the ball out of you know the, the polo grounds you have lefties in Gunnar Henderson, Colton Kowser, Heston Kerstad. Kyle Stowers, Taron Vavra, and Kobe Mayo, I don't think – he's just laughing and thinking, okay, just, you know, that doesn't make a difference to me. And we saw Ryan Mountcastle only would have lost like one or two home runs based on um, the awesome chart that I can't remember. Is Andrew Perpetua, I think, put out there? So, yeah, I, I think it's it's kind of good strategically for where the Orioles are as a system, but I think it's just going to be better for the product overall, get more balls in play, some doubles and triples. I think it's a good thing. Yeah, I, I honestly at first had no opinion whatsoever. Um, being so consumed over the weekend with these international signings and, and that fun that Orioles fans can have with that now, but sitting down and think about it, like Camden Yards isn't going to turn into you know Petco Park. That left field is not going to turn into like Petco Park Power Alley where balls just die. Uh, uh, even Fernando Tatis and Manny Machado can't crack through that thing most nights. It seems like watching Padres games. Uh, but you know Orioles hitters will learn how to adjust. Uh, they're going to take advantage of these new dimensions. Um, like Bob mentioned, and a lot of other people have mentioned jokingly, but not jokingly, because, you know, Michael Elias plays chess, not checkers. And he's, all those heavy power hitting lefties are coming up through the system. But like the biggest thing was Michael Elias admitted, you know, that pitchers, free agent pitchers don't want to come here. And it's extremely hard to get those pitchers. And this isn't going to attract, a, you know, an elite frontline starter as soon as the lockout's over. But if it helps, if it helps where free agent pitchers, middle pack free agent pitchers that can help this team, not Felix Hernandez, who's, you know, got 2000 innings under his arm already. If it helps those guys not immediately cross the Orioles off the list and lets the Orioles talk to them and have a chance, then that's going to help, you know, and you mentioned John Mioli's piece. I thought this quote, let me pull it out here. Um, 
I thought this hit the nail on the head. He says, and yet the backlash has been vocal against it, the wall move, for aesthetic reasons. It's nice to care about such things, even if it ignores the fact that the B&O warehouse is where the eye is drawn at Camden Yards anyway. It took this ordeal to distill what surrounds every aspect of this Orioles rebuild to one simple choice. Would you like everything to be the way it always has been, or would you like the Orioles to win at some point? Uh, it's fine if the answer is the former, but the three plus years into this Elias era, there's a better chance of Chris Davis comeback than that mindset winning out. Um, yeah, and everything, the areas that the Orioles have seen the most change are also the areas that that they've seen the most improvement. I, I think that's a good argument to me. Yeah, and I saw what John means. It would have, you know, brought back five or six of his home runs that he gave up at Camden Yards to the left field side. So I think he's pretty happy with this news as well. You know, when the initial news broke, Nathan Ruiz had it at the Baltimore Sun about the middle of last week. There weren't renderings at that time. There were a lot of questions about how it was going to look. The renderings came out uh, later in the week, and then Sigma Dahl and Mike Elias were in a press conference on Friday. And over the course of that press conference, one of them, it may have been both of them, I'm not entirely positive, um, mentioned PNC Park as having similar dimensions to what the Orioles are trying to do in left field. I've been to PNC Park a few times. I've watched games there on television. Had never really paid attention to how the left field wall looked. But when I looked at it today on, you know, as an aerial shot, it works. You know, it, aesthetics are fine. Uh, they have that weird bird cage by the foul pole where people stand to watch the game. But other than that, it's fine. And, um, you know, it doesn't hurt the dimensions there one way or another, I think. I don't think it makes it an extreme hitter's park or an extreme pitcher's park. Now, there's going to be other things that factor into that. Um, which they alluded to in the press conference, which is the weather, how the baseball is actually going to be made in future seasons, which is a big open question. But, you know, I think there's a possibility here to neutralize it a little bit, which can probably help, you know, like Nick mentioned, help draw in some starters that are in that mid tier of the free agent market, which is really what you're going to be left with on the other side of the lockout to come to Baltimore. And then I think after a few seasons of data, you might get a frontline starter who hits the free agent market and sees, okay, over the last two or three years, home runs have been down at Canem Yards. The team is getting better. I feel comfortable signing there. And if the Orioles, you know, put the money out there to get an ace type pitcher, that can make it a lot easier. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe this will convince Michael Pineda to sign once the lockout's over or someone along those lines. But you know, Michael Ice could have just released DJ Stewart. He didn't have to, you know, run him out there to get impaled on the corner in left center field. Uh, you know, there are better ways to go about this. Yeah, I, I think just statistically speaking from a game aspect, right, it, it's not going to be a massive difference. And we've seen some initial articles, like even Pitcher List, there's a great article there uh, that's done a little bit of research. And you know they've noted it's small sample size data, but it's not going to be an extreme out. Maybe if you're Austin Hayes, apparently, this might hurt him a little bit more than than others. But uh, that's a whole nother, you know conversation about Austin Hayes in 2022 moving forward, I think. But, you know, it's it's not going to be this extreme outlier anymore. Hopefully with this change, the or Camden yards, isn't this extreme outlier. Viv, I think it was Vivek there in an earlier comment that just popped up that said, Hey, a lot of these guys, your Dean Kramer, your Zach Lauthers, you, th- that sophomore class that's coming back next year. Hopefully we see them in the majors next year. Uh, and some of these rookies coming up, DL Hall, Grayson Rodriguez, who Rodriguez for sure being in the majors next year, more than likely at least like maybe it helps their confidence a little more. If they're not giving up that, that extra one or two home runs uh, every little bit, I think, helps and i mean aesthetically if it's aesthetics is the reason that you're so against this like that's fine like you do you but like i don't think anyone's ever looked at that wall during a game and been like that is a beautiful piece of architecture that just makes this ballpark it is perfect like it's it was a seven foot wall i think it'll be okay yeah and you know it's honestly it's it's also good because we have a bunch of good rangy outfielders that can go out in left field and, and get the ball austin hayes um Cedric Mullins eventually could potentially move over there. Cows or Ryan McKenna. I mean, he is a fourth or fifth outfielder on this team. And this is, this is, he's basically a center fielder that if he plays left field, now he can go get these, these balls. And, and teams are going to come in with, you know, a lot of teams like JD Martinez's other world, just put your weak bat in left field or weak arm. So, you know, this is another thing that could play to our advantage, just the way the team is currently constructed. I do want to talk about Austin Hayes and DJ Stewart for a minute. Um, You know, we've had a lot of our fair share of grievances about 
DJ Stewart's defense. And you would think that a deeper left field is going to make some of those problems more glaring. Hayes should have no problem covering this ground. I really don't think that's going to be a problem for him. But I wanted to get your guys' thoughts on sort of your immediate outlook for him because over on the warehouse, a uh, fellow show here on BSL Radio, Stephen Loftus, Matt Corey, and Chris Stoner talked about Austin Hayes a little bit. I think Stephen and Matt are more the mindset that Hayes is probably a fourth outfielder on a contending team unless he starts walking more and hits for more power. You know, and then the health is obviously a big issue. But what do you guys think this does for Hayes immediately? You know, does it is it better for him because now that defense is going to be more valuable? Or does it cut into his power and now you've got a good contact hitter who doesn't walk, doesn't hit for a lot of power? And is good in left field, but not irreplaceable. I think I think it helps him. Honestly, I think Adit had a pretty good comment that probably doesn't hurt speedy guys like Mullins and Hayes because the newer dimensions could lead to more doubles and triples, which I think is probably true. You know, Hayes, he's a guy that just lashes the ball across the field. So if he can just slash the ball into the gap or down the line, he can use his speed. He's a pretty fast guy to turn into a double or triple, even if the home runs come down. And I do think, you know, he wasn't great in center field, but he – he was better than I think anyone expected him to be when he played out there for a little bit. And uh, he's got good range, especially for left field. So I think he can get back on the ball. And uh, I think ultimately it would help him. But he just has to stay healthy. That's always going to be the story for Austin Hayes. Yeah, a lot of my same thoughts exactly. You know, you, you learn to adjust. Like I mentioned, you know, if Austin Hayes realizes, hey, like that wall is impacting me and I'm not able to get over that wall uh, with my power, okay, become more of a line drive hitter. And I know that's a lot easier said than done. I, I totally get that. But, you know, work on that now um, in spring training. Prepare for that kind of full season. Uh, I don't know how the arm rates. Like I haven't looked at his you know defensive metrics or anything lately, and I can't tell you off the top of my head uh, off previous footage. You guys know better than I would there. You know, is the arm strong enough to hang out there in this new deeper left field? If it is, then, yeah, I think Hayes could benefit a lot. Uh, you know, if you eventually move Mullins out of center field, though, would that hurt him defensively? Yes, he can go get it, but I know there are a lot of questions about the arm that Mullins has out there. Uh, but, yeah, I think this does help Hayes as long as he's healthy. And there are some prospects coming up that I think it could benefit a lot as well. So, and I also want to see what effect Ryan Fuller and Matt Borg Salty might have on Hayes. And maybe if they can help him get that walk rate up a little bit. Because, you know, Hayes um, is 26. He'll turn 27 in July. But he still only has 205 games in the major leagues with 801 plate appearances. So you're not looking at a lot of time in the majors. And I just wonder if he could have a healthy full season with this new regime of hitting coaches, if they could help out a little bit. Not to say that I think Hayes is all of a sudden going to be leading the team in walks. But if you could get that walk rate up to a little bit of a more respectable level, I think it'd be much easier for Hayes to stick. All you got to do is leave that calendar in the clubhouse on September and, and he's going to be an all-star. I mean, it seems like he comes at the end of the season every year and just kills the ball. And then, you know, the rest of the year is kind of an adventure. But, you know, I think that just comes with, like you said, the consistency. He doesn't he hasn't really had even last year. He missed some time. So. I think if he can just get in a, a rhythm early, maybe we can start to see those uh, September numbers translate a little earlier in the year. And I mean, it's, you know, Hayes wasn't at the alt site, right? He was up at the major league level with the team. So we know Ryan Fuller was at the alt site. Mountcastle uh, was there, right? So, and that helped. So, and we heard all the reports coming out of the alt site, the different strategies and things that the, the organization were working with, we're working Mountcastle with. Uh, so, you know, if you can now with Ryan Fuller, being at the major level and having working with Austin Hayes every single day, uh, maybe you start to do some of those same strategies. And if it helps Ryan Mountcastle, we saw that walk rate really take off, especially at the end of the year. If you can help Austin Hayes a little bit, then yeah, he becomes more of a, a complete bet, a more complete player. And I think thinking is back to the wall as well, like defensively speaking, the one thing that I do have questions about that concerns me a little bit is I think I remember during that press conference, them saying like the, the spring training facility in Sarasota isn't going to have this adjustment. So are we just going to have these guys go out there like two or three days before the season starts and learn how to play that left field? That that would be a little challenging. And that is a little bit concerning. But other than that, you know, it's all fine, I think. Yeah, I heard that, too. And, and hopefully they can come up with some way to address that, that it's not they're having to learn on the fly, you know, against Toronto on opening day. If opening day happens on schedule, which is you know a separate topic altogether. 
going back to the Pirates for a minute, I had this thought earlier, which was if you go back to when the Pirates were good for a few years, uh, like 2012 to 2014 or 2015, they had Starling Marte in left field with Andrew McCutson in center for most of that run. And those were really two major league center fielders. Marte happens to come along as McCutson, who was an MVP winner in his prime and was still in his prime when Marte arrived. McCutson's in Trent's in center field. Marte has to move over to left. So the Pirates had left field and center field locked down for a while with those two players. And I think that while that is kind of a perfect storm scenario that doesn't happen often, it's something the Orioles could realistically strive for with the amount of outfielders that they have in this farm system. Colton Cowser comes to mind, but you could even look at a guy like Zach Watson. His speed is going to matter a lot more in left field. Whereas before, I think you might have looked at it and thought, well, the defense isn't going to matter that much in left. It's going to be, can he hit for enough power to stay out there? Now the defense is going to matter a little bit more in the same for Ryan McKenna. Honestly, I think that this opens an opportunity for McKenna to get more at-bats next year because you're going to want that defense out there, especially if, and I hope this doesn't happen, but if Hayes, Mullins, or Santander misses time with an injury. You know, having McKenna out there every night seems like a better idea with the amount of ground you have to cover now. I I want to see McKenna get a lot more at bats because I, he didn't get that fair shake last year at the major league level. And he has reached this DJ, offensively speaking, he's reached this DJ Stewart, Chancisco stage where you put him down in Norfolk and he's going to hit 400, 450, completely rake, look like a, an all-star, Barry Bonds out there. And then you get to the major league level and there's there's no you know rhythm to, to this playing time and that was frustrating i think can he hit can he become a successful everyday major league outfielder i don't know i think that is a big question um we've talked about some of the weaknesses zach watson has some of the things that we'd like to see improved for zach watson as well uh when as he moves continues to move up the ladder questions about his uh, overall offensive game but you know both those guys that speed like if they hit one in that in that power alley out there then they're going to be standing on third base with their speed right and there's no question about the defense what they can do uh, in, in left field, even with a few extra feet they have to cover. So yeah, this could be a huge benefit. It's just now questions of, are they going to be able to translate that bat to the major league level? Yeah, and I like this comment from Vivek. Keep McKenna in outfield and move Santander Santander to DH to keep him healthy. Yeah, I think that you could do that, rotate him in there every once in a while. And I completely agree, but, you know, he's just got to have some consistent at-bats because I think he can hit. He can clearly field. You know, you got to find out if he's either just going to be a defensive replacement fourth outfield type or if maybe there's something more there. And you also have guys like Dante Williams, Reed Trimble, who's obviously hurt now. But come to think of it, there's not really too many plotting outfielders uh, among the outfield prospects for the Orioles. I mean, Kyle Stowers could even has played center field in a pinch. Maybe Robert Newsham's a little, you know, <laughs> limited. But for the most part, I feel like you have guys that can go get the ball and can hit the ball too. I, there was one more outfitter that I instantly thought of right as soon as we started recording, talking about defensively, who will have no issues whatsoever with whatever changes they want to make to left field at Camden Yards. The bat is a whole other issue. I know that. But uh, Johnny Riser, like, come on, put him out there in left field. He'll be good. You can he, put up fences all, <laughs> all throughout the outfield. He's going to hop him. He's going to catch the ball. Make it 20 feet. No issues here. <laughs> you, you think he could hop the 13 foot fence? Easily. And, and catch it, but they'll call it a, a home run anyway for some reason. <laughs> the only um, thing that I feel like is going to get lost here is do you guys remember when Manny Ramirez caught the ball and high five the fan at Cannon Yards and then I think threw out Aubrey Huff at first base? Vaguely. Yeah. If you're talking about throwing out Aubrey Huff. I mean, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Always a good thing. Yeah, I do remember that. Yeah, because I just realized now that that was, would have been a fly ball over Manny's head on the new dimensions because there's no way he would have caught it. So that would have been a lot less memorable unless you know he had somehow cut off his own throw or something. I, I don't know. I also remember some weird throw he made when David Newhand went for an inside the park home run randomly in Boston too. So Manny Ramirez, always an adventure out there in left field. Yeah, yeah and – these players, like I said, they're going to learn to adjust to that wall in their dimensions whenever this lockout is over and they can actually practice on this field and get used to it. But, um, you know, they're going to this isn't completely shutting everything down out there in left field. And I just feel like there's nothing else to talk about. So I know why a lot of fans are kind of you know up in arms about this. But 
until we see it in action, I just don't think it's going to be a, a major deal. And I think a couple of weeks into the year, everyone's going to forget about it. No one's going to notice it. And home runs are still going to be flying out there at, at a decent rate where, again, it's just going to be another day at Camden Yards, hopefully. Cause... Yeah, the only people I think have a right to be angry are the ones that had season tickets in one of those 1,000 seats. I mean, come on, you got to find got to find a new place to sit. You, Zach's got it right. They're not going to remove uh, the seats he's sitting in to move the fence back there, right? No, they're not going to bring the fence back. I think it would be about 380 or 390 feet uh, to the corner. So there's not going to happen uh, unless you want to really make John Carlos stand in there and does his, uh, you know, at bats there a lot harder. Definitely not going to happen. Move on to some really good news that we got today. DL Hall tweeted out this afternoon, towing the rubber for the first time in about eight months today. So he's back throwing on the mound after an injury cut his season short in 2021. He had resumed throwing um, late in 2021. I think it was in November or December. So we knew that he was building back up from the injury, but this is certainly excellent news. Hall is on the 40-man roster, so he is affected by the lockout. But if when the lockout ends, we're uh, looking forward to seeing him somewhere in the minors. So, Nick, I'll start with you on this. Just your reaction to him being back on the mound and what you think we – might see from him in 2022 once he's able to get a season started. It's huge to know that he's back on the mound throwing again. Uh, you know, still a couple more weeks away from hopefully a, a spring training. So uh, I know there's a, a comment I can't remember where it said where he's going to be ready to go. Uh, he should he, he thinks he'll be ready to go uh, by opening day, which is amazing. Um, I, I am still a little a little scared to be completely honest. He went a long time without throwing a baseball. Uh, and so didn't have surgery. Uh, so I, I'm curious to see how the Orioles roll him along. You know, what's going to be the innings limit? Uh, how long into the season before he starts? Because I have mentioned before, I think it's going to be like a Michael Bauman type season where it's going to be a couple weeks into the year before we see him in Delmarva or Aberdeen making a rehab start. And then I think he's going to be in Bowie for the biggest chunk of the year. Um, I also know think I said earlier in earlier episodes that his timeline, I think major league timeline wasn't heavily impacted, but now like, I think it is by a couple months. I don't know if we see him in the major leagues this year, but starting in 2023, DL Hall could be a contender for that major league rotation. Yeah. It's great that he's thrown. I mean, we saw a month or two ago that he was actually throwing the ball, but now he's on the mound throwing the ball pitching. Uh, Yeah. I guess I don't really know the progression that it takes to go from this point to being ready to throw five, six innings in a, an official game. But I would think, you know, he if he doesn't start on time, it shouldn't be too far after. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I kind of agree with Nick that it's going to slow him down a little bit. And he might not make it to the majors, but Vivek asks if, uh, if there's any thoughts on him starting as a multi-inning reliever role, kind of like uh, Dylan Bundy did in 2016. So, if he does make it to the majors this year, then I think that would probably be the case, kind of like Michael Bauman did at the end of last year. Yeah, I agree. I think he, if he does make the majors this year, I expect it's going to kind of be in a multi-inning relief role because it's going to be an easier way to control his innings. And, you know, I think our expectation right now is that the Orioles aren't going to be playing meaningful games late in the 2022 season. So there's no sense in trying to push him too far and putting him in the bullpen would be an easy way to manage his innings. What I would be curious to see, and this is getting way ahead, is how would they manage him going to the rotation in 2023? Because you know that that's where you want to put him. Do you find a way to stretch him out over the offseason and then spring training so that he's ready to go on day one? Or do you maybe put him back in the minors for a little bit? Um, but I, I would say that if Hall does reach the majors this year, it will be late in the year and probably in a relief role. That's that's interesting too to think about it. I almost wonder if that's what we see with Michael Bauman even this year. You know, do they start him in Norfolk again to let him stretch out more? Because I think there were a lot of more mental issues there with Bauman. It, uh, it was more mental than physical, and I think some of his struggles later in the year. Uh, so it'd be curious to see if they do the same thing with Dio Hall even because yeah, I don't see him getting very many innings at all this year. You're not probably not going to see him go seven innings deep in a game at Bowie. I don't think so. Um, it'll be interesting to see what they do with him, but he's back. He's electric. He's one of the more electric pitching prospects in all the baseball. Uh, he's a top three, top four prospect in the top farm system in all the baseball. Uh, so it's fun to see him back there in the mound throwing again. 
Yeah, and the other thing to keep in mind with DL Hall is the service time implications and whether or not that's affected by the CBA because a healthy DL Hall is absolutely a prospect you're going to weigh that consideration with of whether or not to hold him back in the minors a little bit longer to gain the extra year of team control. Now, I'm hoping that if we had to wait for this lockout to drag on for a while, that the end result is that we get some something that resolves this issue with service time manipulation. But with that in mind, if that's still in place, then that's going to affect the timeline for him getting into the majors. And I think it makes it more likely that we don't see him until 2023. Yeah, it would be nice to just consider, hey, is this person ready for the major, major leagues? Okay, bring him up instead of, oh, but what if, uh, you know, we save him, we can get an extra year. You know, no fun. I was thinking too, I, my mind's just wandering now, thinking about Theo <laughs> Hall in the future. Like, would would either of you be mad if three years from now you're talking about Michael Bauman and D.L. Hall out of the bullpen as one of them is your eight, those guys alternating, being your eight, nine guys in the back end the, uh, of a bullpen? Absolutely not. Mm-hmm. Tyler Wells, D.L. Hall, Michael Bauman, bottom, you know, to close things out in the World Series. No, I don't mind at all. You got Gene Pinto will be in the rotation. There's There's plenty of room to go around. Yeah, not at all. I mean, you see what Josh Hader does in Milwaukee. D.L. Hall can probably have that kind of impact out of the bullpen if he's a reliever. Um, If that's what D.L. Hall is going to be his prime, I will gladly take that. And, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've missed 2016 Zach Britton over the last few years. So, I, you know, while you don't necessarily have the goal in mind to develop an elite reliever, if that's what Ballman and Hall become, I'd be perfectly happy with that. Yeah. That ground ball rate that I know Zach's pointed out many times how high that was. If that sticks around, I don't know. I'm thinking more bull. I'm going to be thinking more bullpen, but we're going way too far. <laughs> it's January. What else are we going to talk about? So Eric Caps has a question here, and this uh, goes back to something we discussed a lot in 2021. Would you all consider being announcers for the Iron Birds? I think you all would crush it. Aberdeen did not have an announcer last year when games were aired on MILB TV from Lido's Field. It was often either natural sound or the visiting team's radio feed was piped in and played over the video. So with that in mind, would you consider being announcers for the Ironbirds? I'll just ask either one of you. Eric, are you hiring or do you work for the Ironbirds? Yeah, I mean, I'll do it. Sure, why not? <laughs> that would be fun. Uh, that someone needs to do it. If it's, I don't care if it's us or anybody. I just want, I want some announcers in that stadium for this season. Yeah, there was speaking with Tim DeJohn last week. If you haven't listened to that interview, definitely go check that out. Uh, you, you miss so much uh, learning about who these prospects are, and we know that uh, Orioles fans are watching MILB TV. Uh, especially in this year might be another year where they're often most nights they're tuning into MILB TV to watch DL Hall or Drew Rahm. I'll throw that name out there. You know, one of these, or Gene Pinto uh, in Aberdeen, right? They're going to want to watch him. No, we're not working for free, Sim Kid. Um, <laughs> cool. uh, but yeah, like we're, Orioles fans are going to want to watch those guys and you lose so much. The natural sound thing was cool, I get, for a night or two, but like, you know, it, it's, you learn, you, you learn the backstories of these guys and who they are as people uh more about who they are as prospects and you really miss that i think down in aberdeen because that's a good product that they're going to have yeah absolutely i mean who wouldn't want to call kobe mayo's home run off the batting cage roof at ripkin stadium which we know is going to happen probably if not opening day than within the first three or four games yeah. i know you guys are closer i know bob's right there and uh zach's closer i'm a significant difference. I'm here in the mountains of, of Virginia and I'm about to have a second child in April. Uh, so moving to Aberdeen would be difficult for me, but uh, you need social media guy. Uh, DM me. Let me know. Hey, and if we can work <laughs> remotely, all the better. Yeah. So we do have our updated top 50 prospect list coming out next week. It's going to be on Baltimore sports and life.com. You'll be able to read it there. You'll also be able to listen to us talk about it. Uh, As we have in past shows, we started out in early 2020 with our first ever top 30 list. We continue that into 2021. And then last year, around June, early July, Bob suggests that we should take it up to 50. And I read that and I thought, okay, this is going to be a little bit of a challenge. And then I ended up putting a list together that I think had 65 players on it and then had to cut from that 
I think Nick had a similar experience. Bob, I believe you maintain a top 100 of your own, correct? Or a top 75 at least? Yeah, it's top 100. I have a problem. And I also list out every other player in the organization beyond that just to keep tabs. But uh, yeah, it's fun. I like doing this kind of stuff. So, you know, it's I could change it from day to day, especially once you get past 50, 30. It's, it's a lot harder to really nail it down, but it's a fun exercise. Yeah. And I, I pulled my rough draft up that I've been working on. I think it's almost solid. Uh, like, I don't know who you guys would have number one. You guys will have to tune in next week to find out who the number one prospect's going to be. But I also have a list of guys that aren't in my top 50 right now, and I think they're not going to make the top 50. Um, but, like, there are some really, really fun, interesting names that I'm leaving out of the top 50. Uh, guys with legitimate, and I'm not saying this, like, as an Orioles homer here, like I'm taking the orange glasses off and saying there are guys who could be major league contributors at some point, I think in the future, which that's what makes it a little bit more fun as challenging as it is. It is so much fun. So Vivek has a question that I actually can't answer yet because I have not finalized my list, but I'll see Bob Dick. If you have answers, you want to share tonight. Who was the biggest riser in your list? Braylon Tavera. Easy answer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I can't remember off the top of my head, like what our last, uh, Patreon, uh, top 50 update looked like, but honestly, I think I can tell you some of the biggest followers are going to be, that should be an easy one to figure <laughs> yeah. out. Um, might be Kobe Mayo. And I know he was pretty high, but as a sneak peek, I've got Kobe Mayo pretty, pretty high up on my list. We'll say that. You guys check that out next week on the air here and on the Verge uh, and over at BaltimoreSportsAndLife.com. We'll have the full top 50 up over there with reports on every player. And then we will uh, be in the message board discussing there as well. The last time around, we posted our personal top 50s in the message board thread. We'll probably do the same again this time around. So be sure to check that out. And between now and next week, be sure to go to BaltimoreSportsAndLife.com. For all the great sports coverage that is on the site there and join the message board and participate in discussion with fellow readers as well as writers on the site and continue to follow us on Twitter at BSL on the birds. Before we wrap up tonight, uh, kind of an action packed show here. So I'll throw it to Nick first. Any final thoughts you want to add? I love this international process now. Uh, I'm curious. I think I mentioned off air to you guys. I think the one question that we didn't get to ask Kobe Perez that I would love to talk to him about was what happens if there is an international draft brought in. I don't know if it's going to be this DBA or that's going to be something that gets phased in in the next couple of years, but I'd love to know what impact that would have. But for right now, this organization continues to trend in the right direction. Uh, A lot of questions still to be answered, but they're laying the groundwork for sustained success. You can complain all you want and i share those complaints and i get it about the major league product uh it's it's impossible to watch some nights i totally get that but like they're they're playing the long game here and i'm on board um 100 yeah completely agree and i just say thank you kobe perez thank you to the orioles for continuing to allow us to talk to these guys and it really just makes us better at what we're doing because we get to learn more and then we can disperse that knowledge as best as we can so hopefully that keeps coming along in the future and uh it was a fun show yeah thank you to kobe perez for joining us and thank you for listening to this episode as i mentioned earlier be sure to follow us on twitter at bsl and the birds and to check out content over there between now and next week when we unveil our top 50 prospects list on the podcast and on baltimore sports and life.com for bob Phelan and nick stevens this is zach spedden you've been listening to on the birds <laughs>